quietly, please. And the next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 4708 in the name of Neil Findlay on flawed airport consultation. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those who wish to speak to please press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Neil Finlay to open the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Mr Finlay. Deputy President, Officer, I'd like to thank colleagues from the Labour Party, the Green Party and the uh, Liberal Democrats who signed my motion. It's, with, it's uh, put forward with regret that no SNP or Tory member has signed. Um, air travel is a modern necessity, whether that be for work or leisure. Many of us use it at some point. For people living near an airport, they know that they have to endure some disruption. However, it's incumbent upon the airport authorities and government uh, to keep the impact of air travel to a minimum and to reduce the disruption on people's lives. Airports may need to expand at some point, but that should only be when those airports reach capacity, when there is an unanswerable evidence base for doing so, and when actions are taken to ensure widespread community support and real and genuine mitigation measures are put in place, which carry the confidence of the public. Under the current proposals put forward by Edinburgh Airport, none of this has happened. There is no evidence base for expansion. The airport is not at capacity. There is huge community opposition and the mitigation measures promoted do not carry the confidence of the communities who will be affected. From the outset, the consultation process on these proposals has been shambolic and flawed in so many ways. And let me set out why. As I said earlier, Edinburgh Airport is not at capacity. It's operating below 2007 levels. The airport claim they have scheduling issues at peak time around 7 a.m. only. Isn't it therefore ironic that to address the 7 a.m. scheduling issues that they have, the airport has brought in charges on airlines to manage peak demand for slots. Edinburgh Airport is one of the most vocal advocates of scrapping air passenger duty to, to increase demand, yet impose their own flight duty to manage peak demand. And of course, they impose drop-off charges for their passengers. Their brass neck is something to behold. The initial phase one consultation process saw over 200 consultation responses lost. Residents in places like East Calder, Winchborough, Kirk Liston, South Queen's Ferry and Kirk Newton were advised by the online tool to check their postcode or their future postcode to see if they would be affected by new flight paths. Thousands of people were advised there would be no impact. No impact on them, so never made submissions. Then, lo and behold, phase two, Comes, uh, route options come out and these very same people find that they're now very much affected by the plans having just spent their hard-earned money, earned money and life savings on a new home. And this occurred because the whole consultation process is based on the population from the 2011 census. A whole six years ago, six years out of date. This completely fails to take into account the huge number of new houses built in East Calder, Winchborough, Kirtliston and other areas. And isn't it astonishing that the developers at Winchborough, where 4,000 new houses and a secondary school and much more infrastructure will be built, have not even been consulted on these proposals. I've spoken to a number of residents who bought new houses and new developments on the basis they believed they wouldn't be affected, only to find out they now are. The airport claimed 25,000 fewer people, fewer people will be overflown. Yet the methodology behind this claim is nowhere to be seen. Yet again, no evidence base for this flawed process. The consultation process itself has been heavily loaded in favour of the airport. Community councils, whose members are ordinary people with limited expertise in the highly technical world of aviation, have been asked to comment on very complex documents with no support or technical advice available to them. This is completely unfair and loaded in favour of a big, wealthy, powerful and influential business who have consultants, technicians and spin doctors coming out of their ears. 
That is neither fair nor just. But I do, however, want to put, uh, pay tribute to all those community councillors and people in the community who have committed huge time and effort to submit their views and to this cause. But, President, President Officer, most disconcerting of all is how this new consultation sets community against community. They are effectively saying to people, OK, you might not want flights over your property, so tell us which community you want to send them over. That is a divide and rule strategy, if ever there was one. Other concerns include the way data has been presented and the failure to adequately address noise, health and environmental impacts. But we have to be clear on this. Edinburgh Airport is not developing these plans in isolation. A freedom of information request I have just received lays bare how they are com absolutely complying with Scottish Government policy. At a meeting between the First Minister and the Chief Executive of EasyJet in November, the First Minister said, and I quote, the Scottish Government will continue to support all airports to grow the number of routes to and from our airports. The paper goes on, we're keen to explore further route development options with EasyJet and to support their aspirations to expand in Scotland. The policy could not be clearer. Now I notice we have some cabinet ministers sitting in to listen to the debate. Isn't it hypocrisy for cabinet ministers to sit around the cabinet table agreeing this policy affecting people in their constituency in places like Broxburn, Linlithgow, Uphall, Deckman and East Calder, then campaigning in the community saying they are gravely concerned about the airport's proposals. The same government and cabinet ministers who agreed a policy to cut air passenger duty too. These policies are designed to increase the number of routes. They're designed to increase the number of flights and they will increase pollution and noise impact as well. Well, they have been rumbled on this one, trying to ride two horses at one time. President officer, I am more convinced than ever that this plan for routes, more routes and more flight paths is about one thing, one thing only, that is fattening up Edinburgh Airport for a future sale at an inflated profit. It is my view that this consultation is as fundamentally flawed as the airport's expansion plans itself. Both of them should be scrapped. Can I say to our visitors in the public gallery that um, I would appreciate no clapping, catcalls, or any show of how you feel about any of the speeches that's not allowed in this parliament. Thank you very much. And we move on to the open debate. Speeches of up to four minutes, please. And I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Alex Rowley. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I thank Neil Findlay for securing this topical debate. Edinburgh Airport is coming towards the end of a 13-week second stage public consultation into changing flight paths. They were designed in the 1970s when the airport had around 1 million passengers each year, which is a figure now over 12 million. And I note that this modernization is intended to improve efficiency and capacity of the airspace, potentially reducing noise impact, increasing runway capacity and reducing flight delays. However, any changes to flight paths are very important to residents. I know as I actually grew up under the current flight path. It is local people, it is communities who live with the effects of aircraft flying overhead every day. Now, Mr. Finlay's motion highlight, highlights various failings and concerns in the consultation. Edinburgh Airport disputes much of that analysis and amongst other things suggests the process has been independently assessed and audited and is following the Civil Aviation Authority's CAP 725 process. But I want to make two related points. Firstly, I spent 14 years litigating in the Employment Tribunal. And in considering an unfair dismissal, a tribunal was not permitted to retrospectively decide that because the dismissal process could have been better or the tribunal could have done better in the circumstances, its better decision should be substituted. Instead, it could come to a decision, but often highlight areas where flaws in the employer's process had been exposed and look forward to ensuring any inadequacies were not repeated. And I would advise clients at the end that it was imperative to learn from these flags and ensure that going forward, 
the processes were robustly challenged, rigorously scrutinised and constantly ensured all stakeholders were best served. Every process can be improved. And I urge Edinburgh Airport to listen very carefully to this debate today and take on board those learning outcomes. And the second point is related. Buried in the consultations online FAQs is the statement, it is in everyone's interests our information is clear and concise so as many people as possible can comment and inform future decision making. I agree, which is why I decided to respond to the consultation to find out if they'd met that criteria. To do that, which I'd only know how to do, of course, if I got the letter on the airspace, airspace change programme, which I didn't, I had to access the website, www.letsgofurther.com, for those needing to do so. I could write to a free post address, but of course, without the maps and diagrams and FAQs, I'd have been hamstrung. I could download and print the 158-page full-colour guide via the website's hyperlink, but if I'm there already, I'll do it online. And this troubles me because I do think there's a serious risk of disenfranchising some groups, such as the elderly who might not be IT literate, those of more li uh, limited means who might not have IT access, those in potentially affected areas without broadband access, and those who Mr. Findlay flags who might not be so au fait with a lot of the technical language used. I have a real concern that those people whose voices are raised and heard in consultations might be those that are best networked, best connected in a number of senses, and those with the financial and social means. And I'm not convinced that's fair to those who are not, for whatever reason, so able, willing, or indeed notified in time to engage. But secondly, the questions are somewhat concerning. There are eight maps in the interactive sections, uh, talking clearly and concisely, mm, that's sarcasm for the avoidance of doubt, about design envelopes, ICAO design criteria, which preclude certain routes, edible holds, vectoring areas, and I'm asked to what extent I agree with the preferred flight paths before being asked to rate the non-preferred options again by what extent I agree with them. And what does this mean? Liam partly agrees with non-preferred route A3. So what? How is that consulting me to find the best solution? And begging the question, what is the best solution I'm trying to help them find? Now, finally, at the bottom of the form, I do get an opportunity to explain my answer, but what am I supposed to say? I've got a better idea than all of these technicians. Presumably, as Mr. Finlay raised when he said it's pitting communities against each other, if I'm underneath, I'll say, I don't like it as I'm underneath it. And if I'm not, I'll say, great, let's go with route C3A. That looks the best to me. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, I do thank Neil Finlay for bringing this motion and highlighting the areas of concern. I've sought to flag some of my own concerns and would hope that Edinburgh Airport will review its processes and ensure it is the best and fairest it can be going forward. I'm not persuaded Edinburgh Airport should scrap the consultation because re recommencing from the start incurs cost, delays resolution of the issue for all stakeholders and perhaps most concerningly dangles this uncertainty and fear over huge numbers of people in our Lothian communities and beyond for so much longer. Thank you. I call Alex Rowley to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Presiding officer, I would like to also thank my colleague Neil Finlay for securing this important debate regarding the Edinburgh Airport flight path consultation. I have to say at the outset that I believe such is the public concern over these proposals, such as the belief that the consultation is flawed, full of contradictions, lacking vital information and misleading, there is no public confidence in the consultation. I believe that the government must therefore step in, put a stop to the process and tell the airport authorities to begin again. I have been contacted by constituents from across Fife, all voicing their concerns and highlighting the flaws that have taken place in the consultation process. There has been a disregard towards the health impacts on communities affected. There would appear to be major changes to the original proposals, yet those most impacted by those changes were never informed. I have raised my concerns on this issue publicly since the consultation was first raised in order to draw it to the attention of local people so that they would be aware and they would be able to examine the likely impact on their communities. In the short time I have today, presiding officer, I want to highlight just a few of the many concerns people are raising. A constituent from North Queen's Ferry raised the issue of not being informed of changes in the proposals. She said, 
similar to Winsborough, North Queens Ferry was not expected to be affected by the proposed changes, but is now due to be directly overflown by two separate routes with separate wind direction, such that it will be overflown every single day of the year if the proposed changes go ahead. Raising concerns for Dalgetty Bay, one constituent pointed out the combined impact of these new routes means there would be aircraft over or near Dalgetty Bay 365 days a year compared to only 69 days at present. With the addition of Route DO, this is around a further 15,000 flights per, by 2023. There will be no trial and little recourse for the residents to change flight paths once in place. And highlighting the actual consultation document, one couple had this to say. The consultation document itself is severely flawed. It is not at all clear what the flight frequencies will be, nor what noise levels mean, or even clear what heights, what types of planes will fly at. There is no environmental impact assessment in terms of health impact, in terms of wildlife impact or economic impact, and the inconsistent and incomplete information and technical jargon does not allow any confident consideration. They go on to say there has been no trial periods to test presented impacts against reality, so the presentation is as is, is based on technical guesswork. Surely there is a severe flaw when residents received a letter when the first consultation document came out in the summer of 2016, but were not notified that there was a second document and have still not been informed by Edinburgh Airport. The public have no confidence in this consultation. And I think it is time that the airport authorities and the transport minister listen to the widespread concern coming from both sides of the fourth. The minister must bring this consultation to an end. There is no other sensible way to proceed. It is the right thing to do. It's, can I say that silent clapping is not really on either? <laughs> and can I have Mark Ruskell to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst? They, they may be allowed to think it, presiding officer. But, um, can, I, can I thank Neil Finlay for raising an issue that has been steadily filling my inbox since the first phase consultation was launched last summer. That consultation ended with nearly 6,000 responses, the overwhelming majority of which were negative. And that doesn't include the 200 responses the airport managed to lose. In Fife, as we've already heard from Alex Rowley, two thirds of people responding said the airport's plans would have a negative impact on their lives. The airport said they'd taken the findings of phase one, listened, and yet here we are debating a deeply flawed and divisive phase two consultation, which has addressed none of those concerns. It's clear these proposals will impact heavily on West Fife. Dalgetty Bay alone will go from being overflown on 70 days per year to potentially facing flights 365 days a year, 18 hours a day, with no respite. But to focus on the detail of specific routes plays into the hands of this unfair consultation, which pitches communities against each other and encourages residents to say, not over my head, stick the flight path somewhere else. Instead, we need to agree that this consultation is not fit for purpose and should be halted immediately. Last week, I held a meeting in Parliament for affected community councils. Representatives from 20 community councils across six local authority areas attended, and each had their own story to tell about they had struggled to make sense of the documentation and how they felt misled and misinformed. These councils will be writing an open letter to the CAA asking for the consultation to be halted because they cannot make a fair and informed submission on behalf of their residents, and here are some of the reasons why. The consultation booklet runs to 156 pages. It's full of technical jargon, which constituents have repeatedly told me they find impenetrable. Yet the amount of information it manages to leave out is staggering. Professor Greenhoch of Glasgow Caledonian University said it's the most flawed technical document he has seen in 30 years, 
with no baseline statistics for flight numbers or noise, inaccurate flight data, and blatant inconsistencies in the way that populations have been accounted for. There's simply no information on the social, economic, or environmental impact of the proposed routes, because these assessments have simply not been done. And this flawed information has not even been readily available to communities. Consultation booklets were not available for the first three weeks, and some communities like North Queensferry have been missed out of household notification. Now, the CA has already agreed that their own rules on consultation, as laid out in the guidance that was mentioned by Liam Kerr, are not fit for purpose. They're undertaking a full review into how consultations should be carried out, and yet they've given permission to Edinburgh Airport to carry out their own consultation during this time so that any potential routes can be introduced by April 2018. And I would say to Liam Kerr, you know, now is the time to scrap this consultation because we don't have this proper process in place. You talk about the guidance in CAP 275, that's gone, that's going. There's a new regulatory regime coming in. Why don't we wait until we get this regime which will actually look at what the, prop, what the true environmental impacts are of Edinburgh Airport's proposals? In all my time in politics, I've never come across a consultation that's been carried out according to rules already deemed unfit for purpose. Let's face it, this is being run, this consultation, by a private business, as Neil Finlay says, attempting to fatten itself up on duty-free sales supported by a free-for-all approach to regulation. The Scottish Government must step in and force the CAA to put a halt to this consultation. And I call on members of this Parliament to join with their constituents Lend their support to the letter that we will be sending to the CAA next week. I call Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by Andy Whiteman. <clears throat> Deputy Presiding Officer, um, I likewise welcome this debate brought to Parliament today by my Lothian colleague, Neil Findlay. Like him and others in the chamber, I have been struck not just by how important this issue is to my own constituents, but also the fact that these constituents span other constituencies and regions represented in this parliament as well. It is important when looking at some of the issues that have been raised also to bear in mind the context and why this process is now taking place. Changes in flight paths have already been mentioned by my colleague Liam Kerr. And whilst it may be true that aircraft are bigger, carrying more passengers, etc. The attractiveness of Edinburgh Airport to carriers has seen demand uh, skyrocket at peak times. Demand that the airport says it can no longer meet. Edinburgh Airport uses the slogan, where Scotland meets the world. Deputy Presiding Officer, I see it as a positive that the world wants to meet Scotland. And many of those in the world choose to do so through Edinburgh Airport. However, let me be clear, as I have been in my own motion on the same issue, there are aspects of this consultation that the airport must reflect on and concerns it must respond to. My motion highlights, as does Mr. Findlay's, the concerns about the use of, or lack of use of, up-to-date data reflecting existing and planned housing. 2011 census data is not enough to go on it is a, a start and perhaps the most comprehensive available, but as we've seen in these last weeks, a lot can happen over the course of a short space of time. And it has been six years since that census was carried out. In many communities, a lot has changed in the intervening period in terms of housing makeup and the location of housing. Residents in new developments in places such as East Calder and Winchborough should not be forgotten by focusing on census data alone. At a community council meeting that I attended in Ratho, the airport representatives there told us that local development plans also form part of the consideration of new flight paths. I understand too that the airport has engaged with developers and local authorities to assess how housing will change in particular communities over the coming years. That is all good and well, but my motion urges the airport to fully consider all of these aspects of future population trends and densities. It is only fair to do so for those already committed to new communities who didn't know about the changes being mooted on flight paths before they moved there. 
And the airport should redouble its efforts with communities brought in to the flight path envelopes following the first consultation. I have been contacted by constituents that checked the airport's own postcode tracker during consultation one. Some of them, understandably, didn't respond when they realized they weren't within the swathes. To their surprise, they're now within the design envelopes. The airport must ensure that sufficient attention is given to those who did not respond to the first consultation for this very reason. They feel like they are on the back foot. Some people may have had two bites of the cherry, and yet for some people, news that the new flight paths may now be directly overhead has caused them to distrust the consultation process. The airport should address this. Deputy Presiding Officer, the emails I have received from constituents include some very real and legitimate concerns. Although the Consultation Institute has given the Let's Go Further process a good practice rating so far, the airport must be conscious of these anomalies within the process. Local concerns must be heard. I conclude by saying that I look forward to airport officials reflecting on today's debate, listening to the concerns of local people, and taking action to ensure that all voices are heard in this process. Andy Whiteman to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, I thank Neil Finlay uh, for securing this vital debate. Like other members, I've been deluged with emails from constituents over the past few months in relationship to the proposals for an airspace change. And I don't have time today to go into uh, full the anxiety, stress, and impact that these changes have had on families in Winchborough and South Queensferry and places else, elsewhere who have contacted me. Suffice to say that this consultation has been seriously flawed. The airport operators have misled the public and have displayed an arrogance and contempt for public opinion. In my short contribution, I want to say something about why this is happening. Behind many issues such as this lie questions of governance. Tony Benn famously asked five questions of those in power. He asked, what power do you have? Where did you get it from? In whose interest do you exercise it? To whom are you accountable? And famously, how do we get rid of you? Now, in order to answer these, let's first understand what's going on here. The governance and control of airspace is governed by the Civil Aviation Authority and the National Air Traffic Service, or NATS. An airspace change is being proposed by Edinburgh Airport. The decision maker is the Civil Aviation Authority. The CAA's predecessors were the military, who controlled airspace in the 1930s through to the 1950s. Now, the costs of the CAA are met substantially by charges on those whom it regulates. In 2015-16, this amounted to £78 million out of a total income of £132 million. Meanwhile, Nats is a private company owned by the UK government and airlines and funded by airline operators. So airspace changes are initiated by private operators, in this case Edinburgh Airport. These plans, plans are then evaluated by a regulator in the pay of the same private company. Presiding officer, this is not a governance framework that can work in the public interest. And so to Edinburgh Airport itself. Who are Edinburgh Airport Limited? The company is owned by a comp another company called Green Midco Limited. Green Midco Limited is owned by a company called Green Topco Limited. No such company exists in the United Kingdom. Green Topco might be a company registered in Luxembourg or it might be a company of the same name registered in Grand Cayman. So when MSPs, MPs and councillors engage with the wide range of issues relating to the provision of aviation services in Edinburgh, where exactly is the line between the public interest and the private gain and how can we ever know? Critically, are these proposals in the public interest or are they designed to boost the asset value of a company to be sold off at a profit in the years ahead by a bunch of faceless offshore speculators? And so to Tony Benn's famous five questions. How might we answer them? What power have you got? Edinburgh Airport, Nats and the CAA have virtually all the power. Where did you get it from? They got it from conservative governments who privatised the airports, who privatised NATs, and who created the modern CAA, whose statutes privilege commerce and the needs of the private airline industry. In whose interest do you exercise it? Edinburgh Airport exercises power in the interest of its faceless shareholders in faraway tax havens. To whom are you accountable? Edinburgh Airport is accountable to its shareholders. 
The CAA and NATS are nominally accountable to the UK government and parliament, but are funded by the airline industry and thus accountable to private interest as well. How do we get rid of you? We can't without substantial political effort directed at bringing the governance of airspace and airports infrastructure under public control, regulation and oversight. As the CAA's most recent annual report states, and I quote, our airspace is a key part of our national infrastructure, but it is to all intents and purposes a private realm. That last bit is not part of their quote. Presiding officer Gordon Dewar, the chief executive of Edinburgh Airport, told constituents of mine who are campaigning against air airport expansion, and I quote, the people you need to blame are your politicians, he said. They are the ones who sold the airport to us in the first place. What do you think we are going to do? In conclusion, presiding officer, I can't help but think of a quote from Renton in train spotting. It's a shite state of affairs to be in, and our job should be to clean it up. Um, I know it was a quote, but can I remind members that they should be careful of the language that they use? And uh, we move to the last of the open speeches is Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by congratulating Neil Finlay on bringing this motion to the Parliament today. For the record, I did have some reservations about Neil's motion, but I signed it so that this debate could proceed because I think there's important issues that need to be aired. As MSP for Edinburgh Western, in many ways I am proud to host Edinburgh Airport in my constituency. It is the source of some 23,000 jobs in the Lothian, 6,000 at the airport uh, alone. It does some good work for charities and community groups through the community board that I chair. Um, while it is unquestion unquestionably an asset, it has a duty to be a responsible neighbour. Now, for many years, inbound and outbound flights over the village of Cramond have been a major source of casework for both uh, myself and for my forebears. And we may be nearing progress on the inbound flights with a combination of RNAV technology and discussions with the Civil Aviation Authority. There may be an opportunity to divert inbound aircraft over the River Almond. It's a type of diversion that has only previously been offered over Tel Aviv by dint of avoiding surface to air missiles. Now, I'm certain that the good people of Cramond aren't quite there yet, but this would be a positive development nevertheless. Now, as regards the issue of outbound uh, flights, the first iteration of the flight path consultation saw over 2,000 signatures affixed to a petition in my name and that of my Liberal Democrat colleague Kevin Lang, calling for the left turn currently undertaken on outbound aircraft to be commenced earlier at the end of the runway, so as to avoid Cramond altogether. I'm gratified that, as I understand it, the airport seemed to have acted on this call. I thank them for that. But, Deputy Presiding Officer, my principal concern around this consultation process centres around the community of South Queensferry. In the first iteration of that consultation, the design envelope for westerly outbound routes covered an expansive territory over West Lothian. Such was the proposition mailed out to tens of thousands of homes across the Lothian region. Now, not unsurprisingly, the airport received a deluge of responses from residents in West Lothian, some of whom are in the gallery today, stating their abject opposition to this design envelope. I fully understand that. What ha happened next, however, was frankly astonishing. In their second iteration of the consultation process, under the, under the moniker, you spoke and we listened, and buried in a heavy document, the airport revealed that its preferred route for westerly outbound flights, D0, would now avoid West Lothian entirely and instead overfly the Eklund Estate and the western periphery of South Queensferry. On learning of this, I contacted the airport directly, who explained they had received no objections from South Queen Queensferry in the first round. I immediately pointed out that no such responses were forthcoming from South Queensferry because residents were under the impression that they were some 10 miles east of the preferred design envelope and did not know that they were even in contention. Well, they know now. My Liberal Democrat colleagues and I are working around the clock to make sure that citizens in that community are aware of this and are responding to the consultation as such. And they shall do so in great numbers, not only because of the density of populations in that area, far greater than the figures the airport site from the census data that is, as we've heard, six years old, but because of the houses still to come with 
the Bullion Road development, to name but one. South Queens Ferry is a beautiful community. I am proud to represent it, but it is often taken for granted. It, its citizens pay Edinburgh council taxes, yet it is not served by adequate public transport links. And we cannot blame the citizens of South Queens Ferry for feeling taken for granted yet again. I am keen to work with the airport on this. And uh, certainly, I have already um, engaged with colleagues at the airport and across the parliamentary chamber in, the, in, in terms of taking South Queens Ferry out of the design envelope. This very much represents a red line for me, and I urge the airport to think again, to act as the responsible neighbour it needs to be, and to protect the skies above the communities that never thought that they were part of this consultation. Thank you. I now call Hamza Yousaf to respond on behalf of the government. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I thank uh, Neil Finlay for bringing this debate uh, to the Chamber? Can I thank members for contributing uh, as well? I thought a lot of the points uh, were very reasonably made and, and very reasonable. Uh, and some of them, I would say, I would take a little bit of issue with, and I'll try to address uh, some of those points of consensus, but also where I think uh, we maybe, in an Edinburgh Airport, in fact, should be able to, to move forward uh, on this issue. Uh, on, on the first point, though, that Neil Finlay, Finlay made uh, about the colleagues on my, on my left and, and my right, the Cabinet Secretaries, are also, of course, constituency MSPs. It should be highlighted for those that aren't um, <clears throat> familiar with parliamentary or governmental protocols, processes and conventions, uh, that it's not uh, a protocol or indeed convention for cabinet secretaries to take part in a member's debate as for the minister uh, with the remit and the responsibility. Uh, but I should say uh, that both Angela Constance and her uh, constituency role and Fiona Hislop and her constituency role have both made representations uh, to me on this matter on behalf of their constituents. Um, what I would say is that uh, when I have had conversations in my role uh, with Edinburgh Airport uh, on this process, on the consultation, on the uh, potential expansion of airspace, they too have recognised that, uh, that, that, that there has been flaws in the process. Um, they heard those calls. Uh, they uh, then took uh, the advice of an independent body uh, the, as Gordon Lindhurst had mentioned, that independent body has given them, given them that quality of good practice, uh, given them the mark of good practice. What I would say is that Edinburgh Airport, of course, shouldn't take that to mean that they have ticked every box and therefore they've engaged uh, appropriately and that they should dismiss any of the concerns. Some of the concerns that have been raised have been extremely, extremely valid. Uh, particularly, I think Gordon Lindhurst, uh, I would say, uh, made a very reasonable point, very reasonable speech, which I think was reiterated by a couple of members around this chamber, that for those that put their postcodes in in the first stage of consultation, didn't consult, didn't think they would be affected, uh, and then only to find out that they possibly would be. That is not an acceptable uh, state uh, of affairs. And therefore, uh, I would encourage Edinburgh Airport to listen to those concerns. Uh, Edinburgh Airport, uh, tell me, and I ask them. Uh, of course I will. Yes. Neil Findlay. The airport can listen all they like, but some people have moved their family. Some people have spent their life savings moving to a property that they believed would not be affected. Listening does nothing for those people. So what's the minister's view? What advice would he give to those people? Hamza Yousaf. And again, I wouldn't say that's an unreasonable point uh, to make. I would want to go through the process, because ultimately uh, Andy Whiteman and others are, are correct. Of course, the CAA will make the decision. Ultimately, Edinburgh Airport and the back of their consultation, flawed or otherwise, will put forward an application to the CAA. It will then be for the CAA to then make a decision. And I'll address some of the points that were made in and around governance uh, of the CA uh, as well. So the point being is that, of course, there are uh, concerns. Edinburgh Airport, I would certainly urge them strongly, as I already have done, to consult with local communities further. And they've held 24 public meetings, over 1,000 people uh, have attended. And from my understanding in those meetings, for those that have been present, they, uh, the constituents have put their uh, views robustly uh, to Edinburgh Airport, and that is absolutely uh, correct for them to do so. Uh, in terms of my own uh, involvement, a number of members uh, have said that the Scottish Government should demand uh, force, I think was one of the, I think Mark Ruskell said, force uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the Edinburgh Airport to scrap the consultation. A number of others have said uh, that it's the government's responsibility to now step in. I'm afraid to say it isn't the Scottish government's responsibility. This is Edinburgh Airport's consultation. Uh, they then would have to make the application to the CAA. As others have said, it's the Civil Aviation Authority that would then ultimately make that decision. Uh, yes, I will uh, take an intervention. From that. Alex Rowley. Thank the Minister for giving way. If the public have lost all confidence 
in this consultation process and we've seen lots of evidence as to why that's the case. Surely the duty of the government is to stand up for the communities around the fourth and to call this consultation out and, and to say that it needs to be halted. Let me, Hamza, you, sir. let me make the point I was coming to, which was other members across this chamber have rightly recognised that Edinburgh Airport is expanding, and that is good for local communities. There's 600 jobs directly at the airport. There's over 5,000 jobs supported uh, in and around uh, the campus. Uh, one million passengers, when the airspace was designed in 1970, about 13 million passengers projected at the end of 2017. So there is a need to look and to explore and to examine. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll make some progress, if, if I may, because I've taken a couple of interventions and time uh, is short. Um, what I wanted to say was uh, where, another one of the concerns that was raised, which I think was a very reasonable point, uh, indeed, was about future proposed developments as well. Uh, in fact, Fiona Hislop, uh, my colleague uh, who represents uh, Lynn Lithgow, invited me to Winchborough uh, to have a look at that development uh, myself. For me, of course, it seems, and for, for members across the chamber, uh, it does uh, beggars belief uh, that uh, that development, which is one of the largest housing developments uh, in, in the central belt, could be uh, ignored. Uh, so therefore, uh, I think there are some very reasonable concerns, and I hope I'm giving the, the strong impression here, because it is the government's mind that uh, there are uh, deep concerns around this consultation uh, that must be listened to by Edinburgh uh, Airport. What I would say is that if Edinburgh Airport does make that application, to the CA on the back of this consultation, that would give local communities and politicians another opportunity to, 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 to reiterate uh, their concerns that they have around uh, the proposed plans uh, by uh, the, the airport. So it's not the end necessarily at all uh, of the road. On the governance issue, I thought Andy uh, Whiteman uh, made, made an made a, made a interesting point. Uh, no, no, if I, I just wanted to tackle Andy uh, Whiteman's point, uh, if I may. Uh, I want to make the point that uh, Hannah Bardell MP has also raised uh, this issue around uh, getting a, a regulatory body, a body that monitors noise in particular, uh, but that has some substance and is importantly independent. And she managed to secure uh, that commitment from the UK government to an independent aviation noise authority. So by uh, highlighting this issue in Westminster, uh, she secured that commitment, uh, which will hope to hopefully allay uh, some of the fears uh, that Andy uh, Whiteman uh, raises. So I want to conclude by saying that, of course, the concerns that have been raised across this chamber, I know that Edinburgh Airport will be listening. I know they are watching this debate very, very closely. Some of those points, I think, that have been raised uh, have been very reasonable on behalf of the constituents, many of them whom are in this public gallery. I would urge Edinburgh Airport to continue to consult with local MSPs, uh, with regional MSPs, uh, with communities, but ultimately, I would say, if they do make that application to the CAA, uh, I would continue to encourage members who have spoken here, uh, others, community councils, councillors uh, after local elections, uh, and indeed MPs, to make representations to the CAA if they continue to be unhappy. Uh, we all want to see uh, continued and sustainable economic growth. Many members across this chamber want to see the expansion uh, of the airport. I, I know some don't, but some will want to see the expansion uh, of Edinburgh Airport. It's incumbent, as many members have said, that they take the communities with them along that journey. This meeting is suspended until 2.30 p.m.